This is an all-American story. It touches on all of our nation's favorite themes, rags to riches, industry and might, hard work and enterprise, immigration and diversity. It's also about the oppressed and their oppressors, deception and disappointment, stubbornness and ego, indenture and enslavement. But most of all, it's about innovation, resourcefulness, determination, westward expansion. Um, in, in 1714, when Germana was founded, it was the westernmost settlement in the British Empire, and it was all German-speaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I've always said it's one of the most significant sites in, in the state of Virginia, archaeological sites. Um, there were Indians, African slaves, Scotsmen, Englishmen, all in close proximity to one another at a very early date in America in the westernmost settlement um, of Britain's North American colonies. And so in that sense, it was really like America in embryo. This is Germana, America in embryo. The Germana story starts with a man, a powerful man. His name, Alexander Spotswood. Born in Tangiers in 1676, the son of an army surgeon, the family moved back to the British Isles when his father died. The lad was only 11 years old. With no family money or position to speak of, Spotswood took the logical course towards making a name for himself. He joined the military. Spotswood is a very complex man in my opinion um, for several reasons um, he's not the first son of the family so he doesn't get the inheritance so his father buys him a commission as an ensign in the English army goes up through the ranks well he he's first and foremost a military man uh, he's a Scotsman and he was in the British Army and he was uh, wounded he was captured uh, he uh, had his horse shot out from under him. He At the Battle of Blenheim in 1704, a cannonball crashed into his left side, breaking his collarbone, shoulder blade, and a rib. Uh, he picked up that ball and uh, brought it to America as a souvenir, as a matter of fact. So you see it kind of in Spotswood's later life. He's a very deliberate, he's a very planning, um, he's a very regimented fellow, and these, the, the military background, I think, he speaks of that pretty pretty well. Um, he's a man of great ambition. In 1709, Lord George Hamilton, the Earl of Orkney, was appointed governor of the colony of Virginia. But in those days, the governor wouldn't actually travel to such a distant backwater. He sent a lieutenant instead. Spotswood got the nod, arriving at Williamsburg in June of 1710, where he ran into some local resistance. He was driven, very driven. He was also he was extraordinarily bright. He also had a chip on his shoulder the size of Montana. One of Spotswood's signature achievements was to capture the infamous pirate Blackbeard, who was working the coast in cahoots with the colonial governor of North Carolina. Never mind that it wasn't his bailiwick, Spotswood paid out of his own pocket to send two sloops to his neighboring colony to the south. With all the elements of a Hollywood blockbuster, Blackbeard was captured and killed in hand-to-hand -hand combat, most of his crew hanged, and Blackbeard's head hung from a pole at Hampton Roads. Reading about him, I admire him, but I wouldn't as I would say in the tours, I wouldn't want him living next door to me. I wouldn't want him to marry my daughter uh, or anything like that. But he was he was kind of a, uh, he was just a go-getter. He was, he was very uh, exuberant, uh, very aggressive, and he knew what he wanted, and he got what he wanted. To his credit, Alexander Spotswood identified and acted upon three key issues that would benefit both the colony and the crown. One was tobacco market and production regulation, 
another, the development of iron ore and silver, and the third, the pressing need to get the British colonists out of the tidewater and drive west. Spotswood responded to this need by establishing two frontier forts, one a trading post in today's Brunswick County near the Carolina Line, the other a settlement on the Rapidan River in today's Orange County, Virginia, above the falls of the Rappahannock. For the first hundred years, the, the English were really stuck on the beaches, and uh, they didn't get much further than, uh, the, than the fall line. And um, so when Alexander Spotswood came here, he saw that there was a threat of the French connecting up forts, which he called a communication, down along the Mississippi up into the Great Lakes. And so he thought it was just critical for English civilization uh, to move west and to populate the interior of Virginia with armed Protestant families. And it didn't matter if they were English or German. And so, so by planting Germana up here well above the fall line, it created kind of a, a pull of English colonization up to the point of Germana and then over that. I have placed here a number of Protestant Germans, built in a fort and finished it with two pieces of cannon and some ammunition, which will all the straggling parties of northern Indians and be a good barrier for all in that part of the country. Alexander Spotswood. Spotswood let it be known to his agent in London that he was looking for someone who knew how to exploit uh, iron ore which was being discovered in this area that he was interested in. And it, it happened that he had been in discussions with the Baron de Groffenried of Bern, Switzerland, who was recruiting people from ironworking areas of, of Germany. And so um, a little bit by planning and a little bit by happenstance, uh, the first group of Germans that arrived here in 1714 were discovered in London and uh, sent under under uh, Governor Spotswood's care to settle here. Jamestown was settled in the early 1600s. Um, this is about a hundred years later, that 17 fort, 1714 fort. In a way, Jamestown helped sort of get a footprint on Virginia's tidewater area. And they were even in a hundred years were able to sort of develop a system that worked, a plantation system based around t uh, tobacco um, growing and then being able to ship that out. All the plantations were located along the riverways. Well, a hundred years on, that land was, was starting to fill up, even though there weren't very many people still here in Virginia, but it was starting to fill up. Um, the Piedmont was sort of a next possible step. The fort was sort of our next step into that Piedmont. So Spotswood is sort of moving us beyond what the Tidewater, Virginia, early Virginia colony, uh, was. So in a way, this is kind of the beginnings of the second hundred years of Virginia's existence. They came, they probably came by boat up to what is now Fredericksburg and then overland to Germana. And so 12 families, 42 men, women, and children, including their 72-year-old pastor, followed a path hacked through the forest from below the falls of the Rappahannock River. There's nothing in 1714. I mean, literally nothing. The colonists, actually, Germanic colonists, actually kind of carved their own road to get here. Then they arrived in this literally a wilderness at that time. It's not theoretical. I mean, there's nothing here. And then they had to, with them, drag two cannons basically across, you know, the as they created their own road to get out here. When they got here, they had to build their own homes, they had to build their fort, they had to plant crops, they had to learn how to live where the closest people to them were about 30 miles away. It was the closest town. Is imagine this as an old growth virgin forest. And it's going to be that way from this point, actually from the Rappahannock River at Woods Landing, known today as Fredericksburg, all the way out as far as you can see west. Okay, these are mammoth, <laughs> mammoth trees. These are old, this is old, this is the stuff that some of us never see in our entire lifetimes, okay? So that's how you have to imagine this place. Germana Ford is basically cut 
out of a spot in the middle of all of that. We learn much of what happened here from the diary of John Fontaine, a French Huguenot born in Ireland and now traveling in the New World. He had managed to befriend Alexander Spotswood and came to visit Germana in 1715. He walked about the town, which is palisaded with stakes stuck in the ground, and laid close the one to the other, and of substance to bear out a musket shot. There are but nine families, and they have nine houses, built all in a line. And before every house, about twenty feet distant from it, they have small sheds built for their hogs and hens, so that the hog styes and houses make a street. The place that is paled in is a pentagon, very regularly laid out, and in the very center there is a blockhouse, made with five sides, which answer to the five sides of the great enclosure. There are loopholes through it from which you may see all the sides of the enclosure. There is intended for a retreat for the people, in case they were not able to defend the palisados if attacked by the Indians. They use of this blockhouse for divine service. They go to prayers constantly once a day and have two sermons a Sunday. We went to hear them perform their service, which was done in their own language which we did not understand, but they seem to be very devout and sing the psalms very well. The Germans live very miserably. Life here in the New World was a far cry from their homeland in the Siegen region of Germany. Now their priorities had changed from mining and metalworking to basic survival. Although the Indians in this part of Virginia had mostly moved west, these original German families, with their tiny outpost at the edge of nowhere, were the vanguard, a Protestant wedge that the British could drive between two Catholic superpowers, France and and Spain. A second wave arrived in 1717. This was a group of mostly Lutherans who were deceived and diverted from their intended destination in Pennsylvania to come work for Spotswood in the wilderness. These were millers, teachers, farmers, blacksmiths, carpenters, and other craftspeople. Their terms of indenture were not clear. Uh, the first group that arrived, the Reformed people, they left by about 1720 to what is now Southern Fauquier uh, in an area called Germantown, which was um, kind of a rectangle, about 1920 acres. And uh, they lived there for some time and then went west. Their descendants are found throughout the Ohio River Valley and points west. The Lutherans who arrived in 1717 they left a little bit later, 1722, 1724, somewhere around there, to move up into the Robinson River Valley in what is now Madison County. And uh, probably just about anybody who is in Madison County who has been there for more than two generations is probably a Germana descendant. Whereas the French are endeavoring to settle a communication between Canada and their late settlements on the Mississippi by a way of the lakes, our people would, by pushing their settlements in one straight line along the banks of the James River, be able to cut off that communication. Alexander Spotswood to the Council of Trade, December 15, 1710. In the 100 years since Jamestown was founded, the Spanish had developed a swath of influence stretching from Florida to New Mexico and beyond. The French had gone as far west as the Athabasca River and were coming down the Mississippi from the Great Lakes. The British, meanwhile, had barely moved inland, still terrified from the 1622 Indian Massacre that had taken out one-third of their population. In late August of 1716, Alexander Spotswood traveled from Williamsburg to his outpost at Germana. From there, he launched an historic expedition. This was by no means the first time that Europeans had looked beyond those blue mountains to the west, but it did attract the most attention. And uh, this was something that was planned by Governor Spotswood. He was, uh, I think, dissatisfied with the amount of settlement that was going on in this part of Virginia. And so the way you solve that problem is you get your richest and most powerful friends together and go on an exploration expedition fortified by many varieties of alcohol. 
and uh, and and with the, with the prospect of going over to the Blue Ridge and seeing what was on the other side. Along the way, all of these uh, men, uh, we think that the party include was it approximately 62 people. Um, would look at the countryside and think, is this where they would like to invest, uh, where they might want to reseat their families, or where they might want to settle other families? It's an adventure, first probably and foremost. It's a chance to get all of my gentlemen friends to come along with the entourage of manservants, et cetera, et cetera. A few men heron Indians as guides. We don't know what to expect. We could run into Indians, these guides, as well as just being Indians or savages, as they're referred to in the 18th century, it could be, they could be just the reason if we do run into foe, as far as the Indian population, they may be just the ones to quell everything down and give us a peaceful passage, okay? We've also got some Virginia Rangers. He wants to check the French. That's always a good excuse. <laughs> he wants to come at the lakes. That's the Great Lakes, the Northwest Passage, and getting to the Great Lakes. They want to encourage Indian trade. Again, that's, that's always a good excuse. Expand settlement and British influence. Again, everybody likes that. Alexander Spotswood invited diarist John Fontaine to come along. And it is from this diary that we learn where they went and what happened along the way. August 24th, 1716. About nine of the clock, we came to the German town where we set up that night. Bad beds and indifferent entertainment. And it was that, uh, that journal uh, that we rely on for understanding not only what happened uh, along the way, uh, but John Fontaine is the only diarist who uh, identifies what Fort Germana looked like. And so we think we, have, we owe a great deal of, of uh, debt to John Fontaine and, um, and people who write things down. And so they set out. The first day they made little progress, but later they covered as much as 23 miles in one day, despite bears, rattlesnakes, and fractious horses. Several of the company were dismounted, some down with their horses and sometimes under them others thrown off. We met with a large bear, and one of our company shot him, and I got the skin. September 9th, 1716. We killed three, one of which attacked one of our men that was riding after him and narrowly missed him. One bear in particular that the dogs get mixed up with, and he wounds a couple of the dogs fairly severely. September 1st, 1716. We made about six miles of our way through a very pleasant plain, which lies where the Rappahannock River forks. There is the largest timber that ever I see, and the finest and deepest mold, and good grass upon it. It did not go unnoticed that they were traveling through an area of extremely fertile soil. A look at the land patents that were awarded after this trip shows the participants took the bait. They laid claim to large tracts of land throughout this band of excellent soil through which they had just traveled. We were obliged to walk up most of the way there being abundance of loose stones on the side of the hill. I killed a large rattlesnake here, and the other people killed three more. We made about four miles, and so we came to the side of James River, where a man may jump over it. And here we encamped and pitched our tents, and as the people were lighting the fire, there came out of a large log of wood a prodigious snake, which they killed. It was at this point in the expedition that they crossed from the Rapidan River Basin into the James River Basin. References to being at the headwaters of the James River are only partially wrong because the stream they now followed, Swift Run, is in the Rivanna watershed, which is indeed a tributary of the James. September 5th, 1716. About one of the clock, we came to the top of the mountain, which is about four miles and a half, and came to the very head spring of James River, where it runs no bigger than a man's arm, from under a large stone. We drunk King George's health here and all the royal family. This is the very top of the Appalachian Mountains. About a musket shot from this spring, there's another which rises and runs down the other side. It goes westward. From there, they descended westward to the Shenandoah River, 
near today's Elkton, Virginia. We found some trees which had been formerly marked, I suppose, by the northern Indians, and followed those trees and found a good safe descent. Several of the company were for returning, but the governor persuaded them to continue on. About five, we were down on the other side and continued our way for about seven miles further until we came to a large river where we encamped by the side of it. We see, when we were over the mountains, the feeding of several elks and buffaloes and their beds. Now, one of the neatest things they come about is when they get up to Swift Run Gap, they look down and they, they're a little bit surprised because they see a lot of grassland, or they called savannas at that time, okay? Well, they just didn't, this grassland just didn't happen out in the middle of this, this area. The Indians, for centuries, had been burning that area off, so, dare I say, the eastern strain of buffalo would graze there so they could use them for their own purposes. And there were buffalo here in Virginia. If you go to Buffalo Gap, Virginia, or Elk Lick, or Big Lick, which is now Roanoke, Virginia, you see all these names. Well, there was buffalo here in Virginia until 1790. To the queen! And now the toasting could begin in earnest. My turn? Yes, your turn. To the queen's cat! September 6th, 1716. After dinner, we got the men all together and loaded all their arms, and we drank the king's health in champagne and fired a volley. The prince's health in burgundy and fired a volley, and all the rest of the royal family in claret and a volley. We drank the governor's health and fired another volley. We had several sorts of liquors, namely Virginia red wine and white wine, Irish whiskaba, brandy, shrub, two sorts of rum, champagne, canary, cherry punch, cider, water, etc. Many years later, the expedition participants became known as the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe, the legend being that each knight was given an emerald-encrusted gold pin in the shape of a horseshoe, and that a golden horseshoe was embedded in a rock at Swift Run Gap. It has never been found, probably because it doesn't exist, the legend being amplified by 19th century romanticism. Nevertheless, the name stuck, and the expedition has rightfully become a symbol of that quintessentially American trait, to go west, young man, go west. found iron here many years before Germana had had come here uh, or the fort was built here uh, most accounts say that they could just flat pick it up right up off the ground and once they knew it was here and could do that it, it led them to believe and that there would be further iron under the ground itself the first wave of German settlers were brought here specifically to extract and smelt this iron ore but they probably did identify ore for Spotswood, where he later built a furnace. Probably the Germans did not operate the furnace, but they quite likely built it for him because um, they, they had been familiar on, on mining and the processing of iron ore into something that was marketable for centuries in Siegen, Germany. In the beginning, the mining operation did not hold promise. August 25th, 1716. We took some of the ore and endeavored to run it, but could get nothing out of it. And I'm of the opinion it will not come to anything. I would think that by the time the, the first Germans moved off by around 1720, uh, Spotswood supplemented the labor force here with, uh, with African slaves. There was one small technicality, however, regarding this iron ore operation it did not have the approval of the crown. Right. And of course, Spotswood starts the Tubal Furnace up here near present-day Chancellorsville, uh, which is in operation to 1861, and he becomes a very wealthy man, occasionally seen in Williamsburg itself in the colonial capital, selling his pots and his flat irons and all his iron wares that he was producing at Tubal 
and wasn't supposed to be because he was supposed to be sending uh, pig iron back to England because they they wanted to manufacture the goods and send them back here to the colonies so that it would it would basically make the economy in England uh, a lot better than maybe it possibly would have been. I think I think it goes back to the age old uh, idea that you just do something and then ask forgiveness later. <laughs> By the 1760s, during the heyday of the iron operation, six furnaces were operating simultaneously. Seventy-five square miles of forest fell to the axe to make charcoal to feed those furnaces. And so all of the forests that were being cut down to supply the charcoal for the iron industry had a chance to regrow. And they all grew back all at once and everything looked the same and here in the area of the wilderness where much of the wood had been cut down for the iron industry it was just a thicket of confusion. Situated on extremely poor soil this overgrown area would figure mightily 100 years later in the horrific Civil War battles of Chancellorsville and the wilderness. More importantly, this iron ore operation was one of the earliest examples of industrialization in America. It's, it's maybe not the birthplace, but it's part of that early industry. And again, once we're moving out of sort of that plantation tobacco economy, Tidewater area, into new areas of the Americas, areas beyond that, that Tidewater region, um, you need to figure out new ways of making money, new crops, New, new ways of transporting goods. And the wilderness area was producing large quantities of relatively cheap pig iron, uh, which of then, of course, can be converted into steel, and that is the backbone, that is the basis of any industrial uh, revolution, any industrial process at its beginnings and the wilderness of Orange and Spotsylvania was producing that iron in large quantities. You know, uh, we think that when you look at, at um, America's industrial might, uh, it really started here in, at Germana in many respects. Uh, there will be others that claim that they had, they had iron production earlier um, in the north, but it, it didn't provide it didn't provide a continuity it was a discontinuity where it started and failed but here it was part of the mainstream of industrial growth When Alexander Spotswood first came to Williamsburg in 1710, he wasted no time completing construction of the governor's palace. He also built the jail, courthouse, and powder magazine. And he repaired and redesigned the fire-damaged Wren building. You know, he was governed by geometry, led by geometry, and, and so you see these buildings like the magazine, Bruton Parish, uh, the, re, uh, the rehabbing of uh, the Wren building after it had burned several years earlier. At Germana, Spotswood began construction on what may be the first large-scale, privately owned Georgian mansion in America. Completed in the early 1720s, this veritable palace was 20 miles away from the closest settlement. Here he has servants and workmen of the most handiest trades, he is building a church, courthouse, and a dwelling house for himself. And with his servants and negroes, he has cleared plantations about it, proposing great encouragement for people to come and settle in that uninhabited part of the world. Hugh Jones, the present state of Virginia, published 1724. The house was dubbed, somewhat sarcastically, the Enchanted Castle by William Byrd II, one of Spotswood's contemporaries. Uh, the Enchanted Castle looked very similar, we believe, based on the archaeology to what the governor's uh, palace would have looked like in Colonial Williamsburg. 
And like uh, the governor's palace, uh, we had terracing of the landscape here at uh, Germana, um, which complicates our archaeology. It was a little town with, uh, with an important uh, crossing, the Rapidan River at Germana Ford. And um, it's all gone, and we're trying to recover it. On the riverside, the house stood two and a half stories tall. It measured 90 feet by 40 feet. That's a footprint of 3,600 square feet out in the middle of nowhere. I, I don't want to oversell it, but this is, the Enchanted Castle itself is a remarkable structure. We all scratch our heads wondering why such a large home in such a absolutely fashionable um, manner of existence was built out here on the frontier. It was completely unique. So what they had was they had basically an interior of stone and then the places it looked like where they wanted it to look like the typical English Georgian mansion, they had a brick veneer. So it was actually built with stone, but then there was brick veneer so that would look like spots would wanted it to look, but it was built totally different. It's huge. I mean, that's the thing is that there's just so much. I mean, all the features are all still there. Beyond the main structure stood two outbuildings, one 36 by 22, the other measuring 20 by 20. There was even a tunnel that archaeologists later learned did not provide an escape route to the river, but accessed a cistern instead. Today, we as archaeologists sometimes ask a little bit different questions than we asked 30 years ago. Um, today, now, uh, we kind of are interested in the yard spaces around homes like this, big homes. Um, these houses didn't operate by themselves. They had all kinds of outbuildings and dependencies and, and people who supplied the house and, and, ke and kept it going. So these were really parts of a greater system. Well, today we're actually trying to branch away from the house and learn a little bit more about what kind of system supported this house. What were the working people doing anyway? A large concentration of broken off pipe stems found outside a back door tells a familiar story even today. Servants stealing a smoke outdoors and away from the prying eyes of the owner. By 1722, Spotswood's relationship with some of the Williamsburg circle of shakers and movers had pretty much run its course. Replaced as Lieutenant Governor by Hugh Drysdale, Spotswood feuded with William Fitzhugh II and William Byrd II. They resented Spotswood, calling him arrogant. And Spotswood resented them, referring to the locals as a Catiline crew of malcontents. In 1724, Spotswood decided to go to England to settle some business affairs. He left a caretaker in charge of 83,000 acres, 57 plantations, 625 cattle, 73 horses, numerous roads, ferries, bridges, and orchards. As the saying goes, when the cat's away, the mice will play. Take, for example, the story of Mary Peel. And then there was the incident involving the Saponi Indian known as Sawney. Standing stark naked and roaring drunk in the main road through Germana. And uh, he had been given some letters to deliver to the current governor. He was supposed to go to Williamsburg and deliver these letters. And they gave him some money for his trouble. He promptly went out and bought rum. Yeah, he was, he was dead drunk on rum. He threw away the letters. As far as, he said Spotswood was the only good governor the Virginia colony had had and the current governor could kiss his arse. It was also during this period that 80 of Spotswood's slaves took advantage of his absence and ran away. When Spotswood returned from England, he had a wife and two children in tow. He had also secured an appointment as Postmaster General, effectively bringing the southern colonies into the postal system. One of his hires was a young Benjamin Franklin of Philadelphia. By now, the village of Germana had not only a tavern, but a jail and a ferry and a main street. It had become the Spotsylvania County seat. But once the courthouse was moved and a new county formed where Germana stood, the settlement began to lag and eventually die. 
Spotswood, meanwhile, at age 64, offered all of his holdings for 21-year lease and volunteered to fight in England's war with Spain. While waiting to be deployed from Annapolis, he fell ill and died. No one knows where he's buried, although there is some evidence his remains were brought back to Virginia. We just don't know where. By 1750, Germana was a ghost town. Soon afterwards, the house caught fire, the roof collapsed, and that was the end of the enchanted castle. The James Gordon family acquired the property and built a frame house on the site in the 1780s. the second half of the 18th century through the mid-20th century, the Germana story slipped into obscurity, with one exception being the romanticization of the Knights of the Golden Horseshoe. It was not until the 1950s that a German national living in America, Ernst Flender, donated oil stock which was used to purchase 270 acres near the Germana site. The Germana Foundation formed in 1956 and since then, descendants have gathered here every year for a reunion picnic. And so uh, from those 270 acres, um, we donated 100 acres to the Commonwealth to build Germana Community College. And in 2000, we built a visitor center here uh, with a library with the best collection of Germana history and families. At first, the Germana Foundation was unable to purchase the 62 acres on which the old fort and the enchanted castle were located. A group of individuals, among them Randolph Grimes and Doug Sanford, as well as the Orange County Historical Society, stepped in. Well, first of all, this site was threatened. There was concern that it was going to be destroyed as the Spotswood Estates community was developed. Um, archaeologists told the property owner at the time, the developer at the time, that there's this important house on the site, the Enchanted Castle. And he allowed them to come in and do what we call salvage archaeology, to try and find as much information as they could in a quick period of time. Um, and during that time, they were able to, to uncover the, the foundations, the footprint of most of the Enchanted Castle at that, at that point. Um, it was significant enough. Um, more people got interested. Uh, Elizabeth Snyder with the Historic Gordonsville Incorporated uh, consolidated enough uh, loans and funds to be able to buy up five of the properties that today have saved this entire area. Historic Gordonsville then transferred the site to the state of Virginia and Mary Washington College. And in 2013 we acquired the 62 acre uh, archaeological site of where Fort Germana is located. And uh, that, I'm just so thankful that I was president at the time because I know from board minutes that we tried to purchase that land in 1955. A more detailed archaeological excavation produced between six and 700,000 artifacts until the project ran out of money, with 90% of the site yet to be fully excavated. I, uh, I fell in love with it. I mean, you can't help it. You cannot help but fall in love with the place when you take a step there and you realize you're standing there and you are standing on 10,000 years of history, literally under your feet. Mm -hmm. And it just calls you back. Today, archaeological work has resumed at the site. It's, it's thrilling. It's absolutely thrilling. It's, it's marvelous to see archaeology begin here again. I'm, the work that was done here years ago was good work. And um, it's fun, exciting thrilling, really, to be able to come back and restart that work again, to look back at those questions and um, see, see how much farther we can advance the story at this point. Uh, we have it uh, under a conservation easement. Uh, we, look, we work very closely with Virginia Commonwealth University and the University of Mary Washington um, to make sure that its secrets are, uh, are revealed and communicated to uh, the people of Virginia. and. Our members who are in all 50 states, Canada, Australia, and Germany. We're really a startup because the 2013 acquisition of the Fort Germana site 
has transformed us and we have to grow and develop so that we can uh, have a PhD archaeologist who we have hired and have uh, full-time doing work over at Fort Germana also at Salubria this is the home in Culpeper County that was the built by Governor Spotswood's widow uh, it's just a wealth of archaeology and so it is primarily members of our of the community here in Orange, Culpeper, and Madison, and um, and generous members of the Germana Foundation from all over the country that help us finance that. And it's an annual thing. So if you've given recently, please give again because uh, our only product that we can sell is knowledge and 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 uh, gratitude of of having lived in America for 300 years. Another important ongoing story concerns today's descendants of the original German families who settled here. You know, I, I would think it would have to be in the millions, and people just don't know that they are Germana descendants. So we have a Germana uh, genealogical database uh, that Ancestry.com says it's the largest in the world of its kind, and we have, we have 100,000 people identified from just this little uh, place, a 62-acre site across the, the road from us. Um, and we are reaching out to their descendants to encourage them to come back to Orange County and see where their American story began. So this is the genealogy library. This is the location where any of the descendants can come in and they can do research. And we know that there are probably two million plus descendants that live all around the country and even more around the world. Uh, the few that I can think of off the top of my head, specifically Neil Patrick Harris, he was on an episode of Finding Your Roots with Henry Louis Gates Jr. That was a couple years ago. Uh, I also know Eminem is a descendant, uh, Kelly Pickler, and I think even Brad Pitt is a descendant. A man who walked on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, is a Germana descendant. Is that all across the country, there are different Germana names associated with streets and buildings, corporations, you name it. Um, but one of our projects at the Germana Foundation is to encourage people with known uh, descent uh, to participate in the Germana DNA project so that uh, we can develop a robust database so that when we do find human remains, uh, we want to have a very high likelihood that we can give a name to that individual. Uh, and if they don't match, that will be helpful to us because it will suggest that they come from other families outside of the people that we've identified already, which may be uh, African slaves. And if we have recoverable DNA on those, uh, those uh, remains, there has been enough work on African Americans that it will be recognizable. And so, like the original five-sided fort, Germana tells five stories. The first story tells how Germana was the westernmost outpost of the British colonies, ironically, first settled by Germans. It was the first permanent settlement out of the tidewater uh, in the Virginia colony. Uh, it established a beachhead. In fact, uh, uh, we call it the Fort James of the Piedmont. And it was from Germana then that the push west is reignited. It's, the, it's a German version of Jamestown in a sense. <laughs> Number two, the Enchanted Castle was one of the earliest, if not the earliest, known example in Virginia of a grand privately owned dwelling in the Georgian style. I, of course, just love all the things, like not just the artifacts, but, you know, figuring out exactly how it was put together and how it sat on a landscape. There's a lot of really neat landscape components right. that have barely been touched, which say a lot not only about um, the landscape itself, but more about, you know, just power in the area and why did he build the way he did, and uh, it was a pretty amazing place. Story number three, Germana was the jumping off point for an expedition westward that is symbolic of America's insatiable hunger to go west. Again, we say, okay, St. Louis is the gateway to the west, that's fine, as long as you understand that Germana is the gateway to St. Louis. 
4. With its iron smelting operation, Germana is a birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. And, uh, and we can really owe that all to Alexander Spotswood, probably the most uh, visionary and energetic of all Virginia governors, uh, either in the colonial period or, or under the Constitution. And finally, with its German, British, Scotch, Irish, French, Native American, and African roots, Germana is truly America in embryo. Indentured servants and enslaved Africans, and you had all these people coming together in this one small area. I like to say that the area in which Germana is settled on is surrounded by centuries of history. Uh, you have not only, you know, the colonial era, the frontier, essentially, this was the westernmost point of civilization in North America by the time the fort was settled, but you also have revolutionary war history, you have civil war history, we have Germana Ford right here, just a few yards away, and then we have the modern day, we have all the descendants who still come here since the 1940s when the picnics and gatherings began. So I think it is safe to say that America in embryo, we have a lot of history here and it's gonna continue on. It's another um, national, nationality coming in. It's the first settlement. Um, and we're just sort of a, you know, a multicultural uh, nation. And there you, you know, each one of these uh, chapters have something to say about it. Our, our hope is that we will join a pantheon of, uh, of Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Germana. And we really think that um, uh, Germana would have been more recognized uh, had it not been a primarily a German settlement. And I think that nothing, nothing moves a person by actually walking the actual site and seeing things uh, that people would have seen with their own eyes 300 years earlier. And so we think that in the next 300 years, uh, we hope that the contributions of people that we see here very early at Germana, Scottish, Germans, Africans, uh, American Indians uh, will be recognized and appreciated.